Hello, I'm Matthew Hood, Vice President of Government Relations at Dartmouth Health. Government Relations is so pleased to roll out the 2022 We Care, We Vote initiative. We Care, We Vote is a nonpartisan voter education initiative designed to encourage participation in the 2022 midterms. We do this by providing information on registering to vote and voting in New Hampshire and Vermont. You can find these resources on the Dartmouth Health website under Health Policy. As a 501c3 organization, Dartmouth Health does not engage in election intervention activities, meaning we don't tell people whom to vote for, but we do invite all candidates for discussions so that we can learn where they stand on issues and have an opportunity to ask questions. I want to thank you for your engagement and remind you to vote on November 8th. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Reeves. I'm the Executive Vice President for Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center and the Chief Nurse Executive for the Dartmouth Health System. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. This is the latest in um, our offerings for We Care, We Vote Health Policy Grand Rounds. With me today is Becca Ballant. Becca is a candidate for U.S. Congress from Vermont. Ms. Ballant has most recently served as Senate President Pro Tem in the Vermont State Senate and prior, in her time in elected office, she served as a middle school teacher and advocate. Welcome, Senator Ballant. Thank you so much for having me. Happy really, to be here. Really great to have you today. So uh, we have a number of questions for you this afternoon. Uh, and obviously, the first is a good warm up. Uh, okay, can, great. <laughs> can you start by telling voters about yourself and why you're seeking to move from the state of Vermont State House to the United States Congress? I get asked this question a lot because um, a lot of people are very concerned about the, the level of toxicity in, in DC. So it feels like, why, why would you ever want to do this? I get asked that a lot. Um, for me, the through line through my work as a, a teacher and then as a legislator and a legislative leader has always been about alleviating suffering. That has been uh, the guidepost for me. So. When I first ran for office for the Senate in Vermont, I had seen rising levels of poverty in my district and housing crisis, workforce crisis. And a lot of the students who had come through my classroom, I taught mostly seventh and eighth grade, um, and they and their families had a lot of struggles. And watching them go through that um, really pushed me to want to make broader change within my, my community by serving in the state house. And very proud of the work that I've done there on a lot of issues that impact families from minimum wage increases to housing investments. Um, we passed a paid sick leave bill. We worked on paid family medical leave. Unfortunately, the governor uh, was, we were not able to override the governor's veto of that. But all of the work that I've done has really been about trying to make life easier for Vermonters. And as I was saying to you earlier, what's driving me in this moment to run for Congress is really the threat to democracy that, that we see. And while I was driving up here, I was listening to the January 6th Commission and mm -hmm. some of the uh, latest evidence that has come out. And this is, for me, it's not theoretical. Um, my paternal gra uh, grandfather was killed in the Holocaust and he didn't survive the, the war. He was killed in the last few weeks of the war. And we have always said in my family that if we ever saw signs of authoritarianism here, that we would do everything that we could to push back. And so that's, that's the real deep why of why I'm running, um, but also to continue the work that I've been doing on behalf of, of families in Vermont. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a series of questions yes, here. Yes, so do my best. So, yep, I'll start off with one uh, about COVID-19. Yes. How can we not talk about COVID-19? Yes. Mm -hmm. Dartmouth Health and its system members, such as Mount Escutney Hospital in Windsor, Vermont, have been on the front lines of yeah. COVID for a while now. Yeah. The pandemic has greatly impacted our fiscal health, our care delivery in the communities that we serve. Yeah. Um, you lived through this in Vermont, and um, I'm curious what steps you would take to assist with the fiscal recovery for yeah. hospitals. Yeah, I really appreciate this question. We in the legislature, um, moved a tremendous amount of, of federal dollars in Vermont targeted mm -hmm. to, to the healthcare system. I know it will never, will never be enough, but it was really important to us to make sure that we were taking care of frontline workers. Um, we actually passed um, a, 
a bill that was geared at um, frontline workers in our grocery stores as well, people who were uh, on the front lines every day and making sure they got some mm -hmm. um, compensation for uh, certainly if they hazard pay essentially, because that's what nurses and doctors and everybody who was supporting uh, in the hospitals and really any healthcare facility uh, was enduring as well as everything going on in our, our educational system. So it's interesting because I often talk to people out in the field and they say, well, we talk about it as if we're through the pandemic, but we're not, we're still testing. We're still, I just got my booster, you know, my, my, my additional booster yesterday. And um, we're gonna be dealing with, as you know, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I think the, the parts that a lot of Vermonters don't understand is the intense workforce crisis and pressures that are happening in the healthcare system right now. And even if you just take the one issue of traveling nurses and what it means to have to, you know, pay people to come to Vermont to, to serve mm -hmm. as nurses. And what does that mean for morale on, on the floor when you've got a traveler who may be making more money than, than you're mm -hmm. making? Uh, even th those little, um, you know, policy issues that have a really big impact on a healthcare system. So I know that there's a lot of work to be done to shore up our, our healthcare system. And I can't even say coming out of COVID because we're still dealing with it, but it's a way in which uh, I know I wanna be a partner with um, our healthcare systems in Vermont and beyond. Obviously we're here in New Hampshire and folks in the Southern part of the state where I'm from of Vermont mm -hmm. use Dartmouth Hitchcock a lot. Mm -hmm. And so it is uh, a, a hospital that we rely on for all kinds of care. Great. Yeah. Um, I heard a great comment at a function yesterday, and that was COVID has uh, sort of started as a, an urgent emergency, and now we're in an enduring yes. emergency. And, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, part, of, part of the stress that the hospitals are under, you, you absolutely yeah. heard about um, workforce but supply chain yes, is, absolutely. is another concern of ours. Um, yes. Thoughts about ensuring a robust supply chain yeah. for hospitals? I'm very concerned about the supply chain and how um, that has uh, driven up costs mm -hmm. right across the nation. And it's one of the things that I am concerned about at all levels of the economy. When we don't have um, places here in the United States, places here in New England where we can source materials, mm -hmm. that hurts all of us. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, we, saw that with, we saw that with PPE. We saw that with the, mm -hmm. the stockpile um, that we had at the federal level that was not robust enough. Mm -hmm. And some of the PPE that was being distributed was from um, outside of this country and was not reliable, was not right. doing, you know, there's some, some fraud and uh, corruption there. But it is, it's critically important that we're planning for the next pandemic now. Mm -hmm. It's going to continue to mutate. Other things are going to uh, become uh, emergent um, diseases for us. And I think we had better learn the lesson that we were not prepared mm -hmm. for this. And so part of being prepared is making sure we have uh, a strong supply chain mm -hmm. here in the United States. Couldn't agree more. One of the things that really helped us um, during the, the height of the pandemic were um, a lot of the um, waivers that CMS put in place, yes. sort of relaxing uh, some of the guidelines, not, none that impacted safety, but really enabled a lot of, a lot of activities, how to credential providers more quickly, yes. how to help us practice across state lines. Are there any of the waivers that you can think about that you'd really like to see become permanent knowing that we're in this enduring emergency now? Yeah, I, I am very concerned about the, the healthcare workforce. And I, I, I can speak to um, a piece of this that we haven't really brought into the conversation yet, though that is very important, is when we look at providers in, in Vermont, um, specifically also around mental health, we don't have enough clinicians, we don't have enough psychiatrists, and we don't have enough people in, in the pipeline. And so I think that whether it's credentialing, whether it is looking at really um, continuing to expand uh, telehealth, and that, that helps in rural areas as well. Certainly you have a lot of rural pockets in New Hampshire, we do too, in Vermont. That has been instrumental in getting people 
mm -hmm. uh, you know, face to face with with their uh, providers. And so, I think that in the same way that this pandemic has sort of upended the economy, it's really upended healthcare, and we have to see opportunities for for creativity and and taking lessons from this. That the priority should also should always be how do we get most immediate and and good patient care. And if there are lessons that we've learned about how we do that that require um, waivers, then we should be continuing those beyond this, this emergency. One of the things I really love about what you said is learning from where we we've been, to. right? Yes. Uh, and um, yeah, so um, because your point is excellent. This is, you know, we will face another one of these challenges, who knows when, but it yeah. would be a shame to let all of the learning that we've had. We, we actually say in some respects, um, the pandemic has propelled us in ways that perhaps we might not have moved as oh, quickly. Uh, absolutely. You know, telehealth being, yes. being one of those spots. Absolutely. Uh, even just a few years ago, um, telehealth was sort of the, um, it, it was for many people a pie in the sky idea. We never could do it on, you know, mm -hmm. to scale, right. that it was sort of a, a niche idea. Um, the same thing for remote work. In, in all its different forms. And so I think that we have to be really smart to how are we gonna attract people in to this workforce? How are we gonna attract people to this? Really, it's a way of life. When you're, when you're in healthcare, my, my spouse's um, dad was a, was a pediatrician. His parents were also doctors. It's really important. Um, I think people who do this kind of work have a calling. And we have to make it possible for young people to follow that calling. Mm -hmm. And so I am very concerned about also the cost of getting the education, whether it would, should we be looking at more loan forgiveness depending on what um, line of work you're, you're going into? I think mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think um, while we're on the subject of healthcare workforce for a minute, um, other things that impact workforce and have been really um, a challenge during the pandemic and now after, things like childcare, oh, yes. uh, transportation, yes. housing, yes. those kinds of things. So right. I, these, these challenges probably were snowballing towards us. Uh, but again, yes. the pandemic has sort of uh, really pushed those into the forefront as major challenges for us. And thoughts, again, on the federal level, what we need to be thinking about for responses in yes, those, in those really would, gnarly areas. I would really yeah. love to see um, federal action around um, child care. Absolutely. We know that there are um, thousands of people who want to be in the workforce who are not right now because right. they lost their, their child care. Or you have situations where um, child care facilities close down because mm -hmm. they, you know, mm -hmm. honestly, they could make more money yep. working, um, you know, in a, in a retail outlet or in some yep. other other means. It goes to what I was saying before, too. If you have a passion for childcare, if you are good at it, if you excel, you want the very best people in those jobs. And it, it, there has to be a way to make the finances pencil out for somebody to stay in that work. Mm -hmm. um, you asked something else, though, that I thought was, it was interesting. When you, when you think about how housing is such a critical piece, mm -hmm. not just of the economy and not just about the workforce, but certainly around healthcare, right? It is if you are not somebody who has stable, clean, comfortable housing, it's going to impact mm -hmm. your physical well-being, your mental well-being. It's going to impact your, your dental care, all of those things. Right. And we know this. We know this. And yet we don't necessarily see housing. At, we don't talk about it as an important component in somebody's health. And I, I want to get better about uh, drawing that connection for constituents that if we really want to have a healthy citizenry and we want communities to be thriving, you have to, you have, to have safe places for people to live. And, and for me, it um, really was clear when I was a teacher and would have mm. students in my classroom who would come in uh, living in um, you know, really terrible conditions, kids mm -hmm. who had uh, really black mold in their apartments or mm -hmm. they had been honestly sleeping in a tent or, or in a car. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We, you know, we, we know that when families and, and students go through that kind of trauma, how can they possibly excel to the best of their ability? They can't. And, and so 
I really want people to understand at the national level as I go to try to convince folks across the aisle why it's so important to invest in housing. Um, we have to really let go of this notion of that there are peop some people deserving of housing right. and some people who aren't. And um, we, all, we all suffer in the long term for that. Yeah. You know, the, we started out uh, with this question around uh, sort of helping hospitals at, yes, at, yes. at this really challenging time financially. Yeah. And it's interesting, we are now here at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and for Dartmouth Health, really starting to ask questions about, you know, what do we need to do? Do we need to own housing? Right now we're master leasing apartments for the workforce and yes. we're trying to ask questions about expanding our own child care and do yes. we need a transportation system that we need to develop in order to um, supply our workforce. And again, when we're paying attention to those things, which are very necessary for yes. our workforce, is that where we want our exactly. health or, healthcare organizations focused? So uh, yes. again, more no, help I'm in so, that area would be I'm, I'm so much glad. welcome. I'm yeah. so glad you mentioned that because I know I um, had conversations probably two years ago around Mount Escutney. They were having the same kinds mm -hmm. of conversations. How do you attract and keep a workforce when you don't, don't have the housing? and have had similar conversations with other employers mm -hmm. around Vermont. And it is, it is forcing people to rethink what does it mean to be an employer? And as yes. you said, do you wanna be in the business of, of being a landlord? Right. Probably not, right? But the, the necessity right now is that right. you don't have a choice. And we saw that in um, many of our conversations with our firefighters in Vermont as well, mm -hmm. our professional firefighters. They're needing to drive from sometimes an hour, hour and a half away. Obviously, mm -hmm. you don't want that to be happening for your first responders to be having to commute mm -hmm. so far. And um, it's one of the reasons I am very keen to look at investments in water and sewer for, for smaller towns, mm. smaller villages. It certainly would impact New Hampshire and Vermont that there are lots of smaller settlements in both our states that would like to have more housing. And they simply don't have the water and sewer in their downtown the areas to the infrastructure yeah. and they can't float the cost of it because they don't have enough um, citizens to do that, mm -hmm. um, taxpayers to do that. And you can't necessarily ask a mm -hmm. developer to do that because it's not gonna pencil out. They can't eat that cost. And we have in the past decided as a nation that that kind of investment was critical. Yeah. And we can we can make that decision again, but it's very interesting to me to hear you you say that you're also looking at providing mm -hmm. housing. Yeah, yeah, significant need. Yeah. Want to talk about Medicare? Yes, sure, <laughs> we'd be happy to. So many of Dartmouth Health's yep. patients rely on Medicare as their source for health care insurance. Yeah, um, the 2022 Medicare Board of Trustees annual report as you know, predicts that the Medicare Hospital Insurance Trust Fund will be unable to fulfill its commitments yeah. by uh, starting in 2028, mm -hmm. which is coming soon. soon. Yeah. Uh, in addition, um, CMS has proposed annual Medicare payment rates that just don't keep pace yes. right now with the inflation yes. that we're experiencing. So if you are elected yes. to Congress, yes. what will you do to ensure that Medicare continues to be available and that all seniors will be able to access the medical care they deserve. Yeah, it is. The Medicare reimbursement is, is, not, is not high enough. You know, it's interesting because um, year after year, we have Congress passing a budget for the Pentagon that is over and above what the Pentagon even asked for. Mm -hmm. So these are decisions that are being made we could make different decisions about how money is spent. And I think Medicare reimbursement is one of those areas because it is a huge um, safety net for seniors. And a lot of the people in Congress are seniors and they ought to understand that when we continue to shortchange Medicare, it's impacting um, our systems of care. They can't continue uh, to be shortchanged year after year without there being uh, a deleterious impact on the system, you know, system-wide. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about how you'd start on oh. that, on Medicare particularly, things that are on your mind for, boy, if, if I'm there, this is where I'll begin. 
Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think one of the things that I hear from seniors as I travel across Vermont is they <laughs> want to make sure that the care that they're getting and the reimbursements they're getting is across the board, that it's not just for um, physical care, it's for mental care, it's for dental, it's for, yeah. you know, and that goes to, you know, sort of the spirit of, of you know, where we are in Vermont and really thinking, you know, Bernie Sanders really changed the conversation about Medicare for all. Now, in order for a Medicare for all model to work, right, you have to have reimbursements that are keeping pace. Mm -hmm. And so um, if there are areas in particular that you know need attention, I would love to know what, what's on your punch list. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I definitely think just even keeping pace yes. uh, with We're inflation not would, pace. Be a, yes. would be a place to start. Yeah. I think obviously one of the other areas that gets a lot of attention and focus is the cost of prescription drugs. Oh, and, absolutely. And how we really it, we got to have a that. cap. Yep. We have to have a cap. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we were just cutting a video earlier today. I'm asthmatic and my monthly dose of my asthma medicine is $253 that I pay out of pocket. Mm -hmm. I don't meet my deductible mm -hmm. until December. And then it starts over, starts again, over again in again. January. So maybe I get one yeah. month paid yeah. for. And I, um, I know so many people who are not able to do that. So then mm -hmm. they ration their prescriptions. Mm -hmm. They get themselves into uh, dangerous situations. I am outraged at the price of insulin right now. It's mm -hmm. another um, mm -hmm. prescription that I hear a lot from Vermont parents and grandparents that they are watching their kids and grandkids suffer because they're paying so much out of pocket for insulin. And we, we can make different priorities for ourselves. We can and we should. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things that Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical shares with uh, the, the Academic Medical Center in your state, mm -hmm. University of Vermont Medical Center, um, is that we have a robust research program yes. at our institutions. And we're really proud here to be recipients of many, many federally funded, supported uh, research grants yes. and programs from the National Institute of Health, the mm -hmm. Agency for Healthcare uh, Research and Quality, the CDC, uh, and the Patient-Centered uh, Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. Yes. Um, will you be an active champion oh, it's uh, at the federal level to ensure there's robust federal funding for medical research? Oh, absolutely. It's critically important. And, you know, what goes hand in hand with that is I think we all, those of us who believe in science, those of us who believe in medicine, uh, we have a responsibility right now to really push back on the, uh, the misinformation, the disinformation about um, whether it's um, uh, the NIH or whether it's CDC, mm -hmm that there is um, a, a very strong uh, push for disinformation around these uh, critically important institutions that help us to do important research. And so I think, yes, funding, we need to have um, robust funding. We need to continue the research um, and development both here and, and at uh, UVM. But we also have to, I think, be stronger def defenders of these institutes publicly, because there's just so much misinformation out there from, from vaccinations to, to masking to, you know, mm -hmm. I certain, you know, people still um, spreading misinformation about, um, you know, where, where the uh, COVID-19 virus came from, right? right? And so this doesn't serve us. Substance abuse uh, and opioid disorder. Yeah. Um, our region uh, here yeah. continues to experience one of the highest rates of opioid-related yeah. overdoses in the country. Um, and post-pandemic, um, we're seeing that surge yeah. again. Yeah. Um, how would you support and address the opioid and behavioral health crises yeah. um, from your perch yeah. in D.C.? I think we need a federal response to both the mental health crisis and, and the opioid crisis. I was so relieved that President Biden was the first president to talk about harm reduction. Yes. Harm reduction first. And, you know, it was a, a source of uh, great disappointment to me when we were trying to pass um, a bill, not even to institute safe injection sites, but just to investigate mm -hmm. whether it could be a tool to be used in Vermont to 
um, reduce harm. Mm -hmm. and, and it was also uh, vetoed by the governor. And it goes to the issue you were talking about before about research and trying new mm -hmm. things. And we're losing a generation of New Englanders, young people. I have a, the woman who has watched my kids on and off for years, she was actually a student of mine when she was in seventh and eighth grade. And we have remained close. She's been, she's watched my kids grow up and she and her, her husband are, are dear friends of ours. And she has buried so many of her friends mm. from her generation because mm -hmm. of the opioid crisis and, and fentanyl. And I had a, an epiphany not too long ago that we, we don't talk about relapse in a way that's particularly um, useful or healthy. And what I mean by that is there's this sense of you have um, a substance use disorder. You go to get help. You're gonna you know, hopefully find treatment. You're mm -hmm. going to um, get yourself through a program and then you're somehow everything's gonna be okay. But we know that relapse is a part of recovery. There's just so much judgment about that, that mm -hmm. someone may need to do, um, may relapse several times. And so the epiphany for me was, there are times when my asthma is out of control. I take very good care as best that I can. And even so, I still sometimes mm -hmm. end up at the emergency room, mm -hmm. right? Because um, that is what it means to have a disease. And so, I think there is a lot of opportunity at the federal level to be giving more block grants to states around harm reduction and really championing it from the president on down. I think there's still so much stigma around this, mm -hmm. and yet it's touching every community in New Hampshire mm -hmm. and in Vermont and so many families across the economic spectrum. And so harm reduction, stigma reduction, uh, federal funds to let um, us do what we know works, which mm -hmm. is giving people the space to um, stay alive, right? That should be the ultimate goal, first and foremost, getting people to stay alive. And then from there, knowing it may take a while mm -hmm. to, get them, to get them healthy. So wh whether it's more access to uh, buprenorphine, whether it is making sure everybody's trained on Narcan, there are all kinds of things that we could mm -hmm. be doing, but we have to first except that harm reduction is um, the way forward. Yeah, I yeah. really love your description of um, likening an asthma attack to a relapse, and we don't necessarily no. say you have a character flaw if exactly. you have to you know, go and have some medication for your right. asthma. Or right, or I have to go get, a neb you know, get nebulized right. in the emergency right. room, right? And so if we truly believe it's a disease, then let's change the conversation. Yes, let's yep. change the conversation. Yep, hugely yep. important. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Social determinants of health. Yep. Uh, so um, we know that the majority of healthcare outcomes are actually driven by forces often beyond mm -hmm. the walls of a medical center or a hospital. Yeah. Housing, education, social support, income and employment. We've talked a lot yes. about this and that yes. all of those things can be impacted by policy. Yes. Um, We've talked some about this, but really focusing on social determinants of health or social drivers of health. Yes. We're trying to change our language around that. Oh, now. tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, just uh, uh, because it's not a determination. It's not, it's not a not determination. Definite. Yeah, you, oh. you have the opportunity to drive it differently. So there's, oh, there's a movement yeah, to change to social drivers of yeah. health. Yes. Um, so again, thoughts about specific things in any of those areas that we haven't talked about already that we should make sure we talk about. Well, we've talked about a lot of them in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, making sure people have um, safe uh, housing, making sure people have uh, wages that they can live on, making sure people, well, you know, the, f the food that people had access to during mm -hmm. the pandemic. We had some incredibly creative programs mm -hmm. in Vermont around getting people fed. And I think people... Um, forget that when your basic needs aren't being met, that is impacting not just your, your physical health, but your, your mental health as well. And so I like what you were just saying. I'm now thinking what you're saying about a social driver of health because determinant seems too definite. Yeah. yeah, too set. We can change it. And what's interesting for me is I think intuitively, um, nurses have known this, doctors have known it, 
teachers have known it, you know, classroom assistants have known this, but we haven't had the language for it in the same way. And it is, I think there's still a, a sense in New England, when I talk to people, they say, yeah, 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 social determinants of health, but people need to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. Mm -hmm. I still hear that a lot. And it is unfortunate because a child, a child can't pick themselves up mm -hmm. by their bootstraps. An adult who didn't have supports growing up, who doesn't have mm -hmm. um, the, the, the supports in order to do that, Mm -hmm. It's incredibly um, frustrating to me as a policymaker that that is where government can do so much good work, yes. is helping people to get the supports that they, they didn't get, not through any fault of their own, mm -hmm. right? And we could also talk about um, gun violence mm -hmm. in New England. And Vermont is an outlier yeah. on suicides and, and gun death and um, domestic violence. And mm -hmm. so it is... Um, I think we all have to get um, more comfortable with having more candid conversations um, within our communities about these, um, mm -hmm. these issues that are impacting the community's health. Um, but curious, what are some of the initiatives that you're, you're trying here that are kind of new on the radar screen that I should be thinking about? I heard about a terrific one yesterday, in fact, and it was from a... Um, social service agency in Vermont, um, in Heartland, uh, Hartford, Vermont, the, the Haven. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. And um, again, uh, we were talking about the importance of um, uh, making sure people have adequate food right. uh, as just a basic, a right. basic need and um, really addressing the issue of food insecurity. And uh, I was so impressed, uh, the executive director was actually talking about um, programs right here at the medical center mm -hmm. that I was thrilled to hear about, but they're, they're actually establishing food pantries in places where families are coming for care. They're in our cancer center there. for yes. people who are, yeah, yeah uh, obviously schools. So it's, it's right. more thinking about changing the paradigm from if you're in need, you need to make your way to a Food shelf. Food, food yes. shelf or a pantry that's right. open from 11 to 2. It's more, let's meet the people where they are, right. the kids where they are, yeah. and make sure we're feeding them that way. So that, that was just yes. an example of something I was yes. learning about yesterday. And I was like, yes. Um, yes. Some, someone um, years ago said, if you really want to improve learning for children in our schools, feed the children. Yes. Yes, I absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why we went to um, extended our universal school meals program, mm -hmm. because we know that if you are not coming into a classroom with a full belly, you're not going, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to do your best. Exactly. Because we don't, we get, we get peckish, we get <laughs> headaches, right? We don't do our best when we're hungry That's right. and students don't either. That's right. Yeah. So, um, we're drawing close to an end here, but I don't want the time to get away from us without asking you about diversity, yes. equity, inclusion, and belonging. Yes. Can you share your views about this really important topic and how you would work to address that? Absolutely. You know, I, I had a really interesting time this past um, legislative session. The Speaker of the House and I did a listening session mm -hmm. across the state around how we should invest uh, COVID dollars. And one of the things that came out of those, just had dozens and dozens of, of conversations of all different sizes um, around, the, around the state. And what one of the themes that came through was that people of color in Vermont, many of them do not feel comfortable getting their health care mm -hmm. in Vermont. They feel like their um, providers may not understand um, the experiences that, that they have been through. And I talk to a number of constituents who routinely drive out of state mm -hmm. to New York or Massachusetts to get their health care. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not, for me, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. I want people to be able to access care that feels um, holistic and, and an understanding of um, their issues and experiences around what does it feel like to have that added level of stress when you are going through the day experiencing microaggressions. What is it like when you have a doctor or a nurse who doesn't 
truly understand uh, what your experience may be in um, experiencing uh, racism. And so I have been um, working uh, within the legislature to really change our ideas about implicit bias because we write the policies. And if we are not even aware of our own implicit bias, we're not going to be passing legislation that really is focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, um, you know, one thing that we worked on in Vermont as well was looking, you know, at the issue of um, women of color and what happens for them during pregnancy and, and birth, and that the rates of uh, dangerous um, situations happening when they're in labor is um, really alarming, and that we need to be, again, honest about the fact that if you're giving everyone the same care and the outcomes are not are, are not the same, mm -hmm. then that is not equity, mm -hmm. right? And um, always pushing, whether it's in the, uh, the healthcare environment or whether it's in a legal uh, environment, making sure that people are feeling um, not just um, tolerated, but welcome mm -hmm. and understood and part of a, a kind of collaboration to make the healthcare provider situation one that feels mm -hmm. truly um, comfortable and healthy. What are some of the initiatives that, that you are taking on here in mm -hmm. at Dartmouth? Um, so we have a um, leader uh, that we have brought to our community um, whose job it is to focus um, singularly on mm -hmm. helping us learn more. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned implicit bias training. Certainly mm -hmm. that's been part of it, but also really doing a, a scan across our organization. Yeah. Everything from how are we recruiting yes. individuals Absolutely. into our organization? Yeah. You know, are, are, are our recruitment processes um, robust and really encouraging of mm -hmm. um, candidates from all right. uh, diverse um, kinds of backgrounds? How are we creating environments within our center? So uh, again, this issue of belonging, yes. um, so that really people see themselves as um, part of this community. We've got, again, sort of a cool thing we do here. It's the employee resource groups. Mm -hmm. Anyone can start one, but you know, pretty much it encourages people to come and both learn mm. about a, a diverse corner of our uh, organization, mm -hmm. but also participate and do things and form community so that people don't tend to feel alone uh, in yes. the organization. Mm -hmm. Our students are uh, probably our greatest source of diversity sure. in, our, in our center. Yes. So um, again, making sure they feel welcome and um, as they tell us how to create an excellent learning environment mm, for them. Mm -hmm. They are always talking to us about what do we need to do to improve this mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, environment so that it is more inclusive mm. and welcoming for students of all yeah. races, backgrounds, generations. That's another thing we're trying to learn yes. about. Yes. We now have five generations in the workforce. And... Um, their needs are not all the same. No, they are not. At all. No, so, their needs, their goals, their desires, and what they hope to get out of their work. Yeah. You betcha. Yes. Uh, and how they want to be communicated with and everything along yes. that line. So, yes. um, so DEIB is something we are, we are really invested in here now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, again, it's a workforce strategy, but it's also the right thing to do as a healthcare organization. Absolutely. And, you know, if I could just share a, a little story. I was speaking at an event um, a couple weeks ago and talking about the issue of student loan forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it is, if you look at the issue through the lens of racial equity, you know, if you are um, a black or brown woman or man in this country, you're much more likely to be carrying $25,000 more debt than mm -hmm. the white neighbor down the street. Mm -hmm. and. There are historical reasons for that. Mm -hmm. One of them being that you, if you were a, um, a black veteran coming back from World War II, you couldn't take advantage, take of, the advantage GI of the GI program. Right? right? And so the wealth disparity has roots generations ago, but we are still needing to acknowledge that. Again, we, we're not all starting at the same starting line. That's right. right. And so how do we make jobs more possible 
you know, we're thinking about this in terms of, you know, if I am fortunate to, to get to Congress, um, we really want to set up our offices in a different way so that you shouldn't have to um, be a wealthy person to be able to intern with uh, a House member or a senator. Mm -hmm. It just continues that cycle of the haves and the have-nots. And so how do you structure your office so people from all different backgrounds have an opportunity you know, to be part of this really exciting thing, which is government? So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. What haven't I asked you that you'd like to make sure you get to share with our audience today? You know, I think I would just say that I know from the, you know, talking to the nurses and the doctors and all of the healthcare workers across uh, Vermont, and I'm sure it's true in New Hampshire as well, you've all worked above and beyond. You are so exhausted from the pandemic and all of the tension that was experienced, you know, during those really, really horrible, uh, intense, um, heightened emergency months. And we're going to have to be doing a lot of work for the years to come around the trauma that's been experienced by mm -hmm. the healthcare workforce, mm -hmm. because um, you saw a lot of tragedy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for acknowledging that. Yeah, You're welcome. Great. Well, let me say thank you so much thank you. Um, for spending this time with me today, Senator Ballant, um, and best wishes to you. Thank you. Um, as you go forward uh, in your campaign, um, I'd like to say thank you all for joining us today at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and Dartmouth Dartmouth Health's uh, We Care We Vote session today. Um, and just a reminder: don't forget to vote on November eighth. Thanks so much. <laughs>